Well, good evening. I hope you can hear me. Thank you for logging in to Signposts. We continue this series looking at incidents in the Old Testament of the Bible which really act as signposts pointing forward to the Lord Jesus and the work that he did on Calvary. Tonight our uh, talk is entitled Victory in the Valley. And the valley in question is the Valley of Elah, which lay about 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem. On the north side of the valley, the Israelite army was encamped. On the south side, their oppressors and enemies, the Philistines, their army was standing there. And it seems that there's a battle about to begin, but there is a kind of stalemate. And maybe one of the reasons for the stalemate was apparently running right through the middle of this valley, there was a deep ravine. And the Philistines normally favoured, their favourite weapon of warfare was their iron chariots, but they'd be no good in such a situation. And so it seems that the battle is going to be decided in a duel of champions. Now, this was a well-known uh, method of warfare, and it was used even in our own country's history up until uh, fairly recent times, I suppose. But in Bible times, it was an accepted method of settling the battle. So one side would choose a champion, the other would choose a champion, and depending on the outcome of the duel between them, these champions represented the two different forces, and depending who won, well, the battle, the victory was theirs. And the Philistines unveil their secret weapon, and he's a monster. His name's Goliath, and he's at least nine feet, six inches tall, perhaps even taller, and he's uh, covered from head to toe with armor. He's, uh, he's, got, he's wielding massive weapons. And as soon as he steps forward, you can just imagine how the Israelites must have felt as they look at this massive, incredible hulk of a death-dealing, killing machine. And, uh, of course, not one of them is able to stand up to Goliath. And the Bible tells us that Saul, who was the king at the time, he was probably the tallest man in Israel. He was head and shoulders above everybody else, but he's sitting in his tent. Uh, I don't know if he was cowering in his tent, but certainly he's not putting his name forward. And day after day, the great uh, giant Goliath, the great champion of the Philistines, for 40 days, he goes down into the valley and he issues his challenge, give me a man so that we can fight together. And there is nobody on the Israelite side who is willing to take up the challenge. We can quite understand it. And then David arrives. David is just a young, fresh-faced teenager. And he arrives, he's been sent by his father to see how his brothers and the army are doing and to bring them some food. And as David realizes what is going on and finds out, and just as he's there, it seems he's just come at the right time, or maybe the wrong time, he's just come at the right time, Goliath comes down into the valley and issues his challenge. And David says, I'll be the volunteer. I'll be the champion who'll fight on behalf of the Israelites. Well, it almost seems laughable. Here is this fresh-faced young teenager who's got no experience of conflict at all, really, it seems, and he's going to fight this massive monster of a man. But there's no doubt about it that David is in earnest about it. You know the story, I'm sure, from Sunday school days. And eventually, uh, despite all their misgivings, David is enlisted to become the champion. Uh, and this duel is going to take place. It's going to be David versus Goliath. Let's read how it went in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll read from verse 42. 1 Samuel 17, 42. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he belittled him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike 
you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Amen. What a thrilling story. It has thrilled generations of children at the Sunday school. But of course, it's a true story. It's a true story of a wonderful victory. This incredible a story that David, against all the odds, seemingly so unnatural, so illogical, uh, and yet uh, he emerges from the valley, the undisputed victor. He's won a tremendous victory. Dear friends, the centuries roll past, and one of David's descendants goes down into another valley, into the valley of death, and he emerges a far greater victor than David ever was. We're talking about the Lord Jesus, of course. He is the son of David. And this incident, this dramatic incident, it is a signpost that points us forward to a far greater victory that was won when the Lord Jesus went down into the valley of death, and he came up out of the valley, a mighty victor. That's our subject tonight. What a glorious, wonderful subject it is. You see, dear friends, Goliath was a picture, really, of the great enemy of mankind, Satan himself. Uh, the Bible describes Satan as the great enemy of the human race. He lured Adam and Eve into sinning against God, and by doing so, he brought death into the world, into humanity, and as a result, he has reigned over mankind, kept them in oppression, slaves to sin and to Satan, and living in fear of death, and there is no one that can stand up to him. There is no human being that can deliver themselves out of the oppression and slavery of Satan. But the wonderful thing is that there is a victor coming, that there is a victory coming, and that's what we're going to think about tonight. I want to read just two additional verses over in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. This is about the victory the Lord Jesus won on the cross. For as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Dear friends, we want to think about this for a moment, how this dramatic victory back in Old Testament times it really speaks to us of the victory the Lord Jesus won when he died on the cross for our sins. I want to just point out three very simple things uh, very briefly. First of all, his entry into the ranks. Just as David didn't really belong in the army, just as he was sent by his father, just as you might say he came just at the right time. So the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus entered into the ranks of humanity. This very verse we've read tells us that because human beings partook of flesh and blood, he likewise took part of the same. In other words, it's telling us that one day the Lord Jesus stepped into this world and became a member of the human race, completely different, completely sinless from every other human being. And yet the Bible says he came for this very purpose to deliver humanity from the slavery of sin. 
And so John the Apostle writes that for this cause, the Son of God was manifested, that he, he came to light, the Lord Jesus came onto the public scene. Why? So that he might destroy the works of the devil. Dear friends, this is a wonderful story, a wonderful picture that tells us that just as David was enlisted into the ranks of the army, so our Lord Jesus Christ was enlisted. He entered humanity so that he might, as a perfect man, a sinless man, so that he might win the great victory at Calvary. Secondly, not just to think of his entry into the ranks, but think about his triumph over the enemy. A verse says that he destroyed him that has the power of death, that is the devil. Well, how did he do that? Well, he did it just the same way that David did it. You, you'll notice in the, in the reading in the Old Testament how that uh, the stone that came flying from David's sling, you could almost say, I'm not sure if it actually killed Goliath, but it certainly stunned him, it knocked him down, it rendered him powerless. But then what David actually did then was he went and he put his foot on the chest of this big giant and he pulled out Goliath's own sword and he used his own weapon and he took Goliath's own sword and he swung it and he chopped off his head. He decapitated him, he killed him, he destroyed him with his own weapon. Dear friends, this is wonderful. What was the great weapon that Satan had? What was the great thing that he ruled over mankind with? It was death. That was it. The Bible says that through fear of death, he kept humanity in bondage. And when the Bible talks about death, it doesn't simply mean physical death. It means spiritual death, separation from God, because uh, mankind sinned against God. We've, we've died as far as God is concerned in a spiritual sense. We're going to die physically. And the tragedy is, and the, the dreadful possibility is, that we could die eternally separated from God under his judgment. That's what Satan wants, and that's the power that he has. Well, how did the Lord Jesus destroy Satan? He used Satan's weapon. He used death. That's what the verse tells us, that by death he might destroy him that had the power of death. I think this is absolutely wonderful that the Lord Jesus, by dying himself, it was the last thing that Satan could have imagined that the Lord Jesus would use. He didn't use his power. He didn't use his miracle working ability. He didn't even use his teaching or his word or his, the power of his word. He had to die on the cross, and he took Satan's weapon, and he used it. And the Bible says when he died on the cross, in a way that we possibly will never understand. When he died and rose from the dead, he won a tremendous victory over Satan, and he rendered him powerless, and he secured his final and absolute and utter defeat. This is tremendous. You know, even the most faithful followers, those who loved the Lord Jesus, they thought that when the Lord Jesus died on the cross that he was defeated. They thought it was a tragedy. And only later did they come, well, they soon came to realize, when they saw him uh, risen from the dead, they came to realize it wasn't a tragedy, it was a triumph, that the Lord Jesus wasn't the victim, he was the victor. And dear friends, this is wonderful, because Christ died on the cross, he has rendered powerless the great enemy of mankind, and he's made it possible for those who were in bondage for centuries, he's made it possible for those members of humanity to be delivered, to be set free. And I want to finish on this note. We've thought about his entry into the ranks. We've thought about his defeat of the enemy. We're going to think finally of the spoils of his victory. Because you see, we didn't read it right to the end of the chapter, but had we read at the end of chapter 17, we discover that this resulted in the complete rout of the Philistine army. And we find that the Israelites are now dividing the spoils. It's a wonderful thing for them. They've not only survived, they were glad just to survive. They've not only survived, but they find they've got in their hands, they've got riches they never dreamt they'd ever have. 
You know, isn't that wonderful? That's the spoils of the victory, dear friends. When I was saved, I'll tell you this, when I trusted the Lord Jesus to be my savior, I was just glad that I wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be in hell. I wasn't going to be under God's judgment. That would have been fine for me, but I didn't realize this, that because of the victory of my savior on the cross, my hands are filled with riches I could never imagine. To think that I have peace with God, to think that God is my father, to think that I'm absolutely certain of being in heaven, to know that I've been forgiven, to think that the Holy Spirit is living within me. These are the spoils, the riches of his victory. And dear friends, what I have and what every Christian has, you can have too, because the Lord Jesus has, has won this great victory so that you might be liberated, so that you might be forgiven, so that your sins might be taken away, and so that you might be blessed, the Bible says, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I wonder, have you realized that this death of the Lord Jesus on the cross what a mighty victory it was. And because he died, because he was willing to pay that price, and because he rose from the dead, he has dealt with my sins. He has dealt with sin, and he's dealt with Satan, and he's dealt with judgment. It's all finished. That's why he cried when he died on the cross. It is finished. He was signaling that the mighty victory has been won. And so as I think of David coming out of the valley and he's got in his hand, it's a bit grisly, but he's got in his hand the head of the giant. And it's the token that he has won a great victory. I think of my savior coming up out of the grave and his victory is plain for all to see. And dear friend, you can benefit from it. You can only benefit from it if you turn to him tonight and turn from your sins and believe that he died for you and trust him to be your savior. No wonder they're flocking now to make David the king. They're all following David. They think he's wonderful. And so he was. Dear friends, he doesn't compare with our savior. What a wonderful savior he is. And he's willing to be your savior tonight if you'll simply trust in him. You can do that now as we pray. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we give thanks for the wonderful picture this is of the Lord Jesus dying on the cross and by doing so, winning the victory. We praise thee that he was not defeated. We give thanks it was not a tragedy. We thank thee it was a plan that was carried out in a masterly, absolutely perfect way. We praise thee for what the Savior has done and for what he can do for everyone who trusts in him. May it be that somebody listening to this tonight may come to him and trust him for their salvation. We pray for thy blessing now in his name. Amen.